goes back to the Supreme Court, struck down again. <laughs> now, during this whole time, military commission's proceedings are stayed. At this point, there's only, I think, been one conviction by a military con commission after seven years. Many of the people who are being held to go before the military commissions, they simply don't have the evidence. So what have we accomplished? This military commission's order, ineptly done, not run by the right people, not put into good legislation, struck down twice by the Supreme Court, yielding almost no convictions, should just be scrapped. You never need it in the first place. It was wrong to pursue it in the first place. Let's not throw good time after bad. It should be repealed. Now, what about the people who are being held? Some of them, by the way, only a few people have been tried less than, I mean, charged less than six or seven. Those they can make a criminal case on, bring them to the United States, hold them, try them. They've gotten convictions against Jose Padilla, a couple of other people. Those that they can't try, extradite them. Those they have no evidence on, release them with protections. Now, I was testifying just Monday before the Senate Judiciary Committee, and Senator Brownback, who's the ranking member, says to me, he's from Kansas, you're not saying Guantanamo detainees should be brought to Leavenworth, Kansas. <laughs> you know, not in my backyard. <laughs> now, we're, you know, we're not talking about more than three or four people. And he went on and on. It's so unsafe, we can't have him done. I said to him, Senator, Timothy McVeigh killed hundreds of people on U.S. soil. He was brought to a supermax prison in Colorado. He was tried, convicted, and executed. He got due process of law. Nobody questions that. And he threatened nobody. Uh, we have a lot of people in these prisons in the U.S. soil, and they're getting due process, and they're not security risks. The real question is, why did you treat this group of people differently and turn a naval base into a prison camp, which ended up being an eyesore to the world? Now the President of the United States thinks it can be closed, should be closed, and he can't figure out when to close it. <laughs> and now he's leaving it for his successor. Which is what brings me to my suggestion. There's an important precedent here, which many of you remember, in 1979, 1980, during the Iranian hostages crisis, you know, Jimmy Carter was defeated by Ronald Reagan. The transition teams worked together closely, and they got the hostages out on Inauguration Day. And they did it by threatening the Iranians with the threat of facing Ronald Reagan as president if they hadn't released them. Now, I think that's a very important precedent. The fact of the matter is, that the transition team should start working together, and I outlined how. And it's a complicated process. It involves many agencies. It involves diplomacy, Justice Department action, Defense Department action, intelligence action. The transition teams should focus on this on the day after election day. But the problem is, as you know, we don't know who's gonna be president. They may not have enough time to plan a, a transition. The election is so close. <coughs> that we could end up stumbling into the exact same kind of disaster again. And uh, that's the tragedy of it. It's one sh example of shooting ourselves in the foot after another. Uh, firstly, uh, welcome to Cleveland, uh, Dean Cope. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Taff has mentioned uh, the fear of loss of sovereignty, but I wanted to address another fear. Uh, since 9-11, I believe there's been a a sense of fear that's enveloped our country. It's resulted in uh, isolationist uh, sentiments and the relegation of the ideals that you've espoused to a, to a secondary level. Now, this fear is not unique in our history. During World War II, on the West Coast, Japanese Americans were interned. Uh, but you've asked Americans to check our politicians and, 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 and promote what you know, your goals are. But how do, how do we overcome this fear that, that prevails, that's so strong, that, that touches all of our lives, that we no longer feel these freedoms are, are as important as our safety? Well, I, I think it's hard. Um, well, first of all, I, I was reacting against the idea that if you're not with the administration on these plans, you're with the terrorists. I, I'm not with the terrorists. I have uh, acquaintances who were killed in 9-11. There was another way to respond. You can be against the terrorists uh, and not be in favor of these policies which have turned out to be disastrous. 
if they had been designed better in the first place, we'd have more safety, less chaos, and a better outcome. Point two, many people, including lawyers, treated 9-11 as kind of this Tina Turner moment. You know, what's law got to do with it? You know, what's law but a sweet old-fashioned notion? You know, they say, we're at war. Well, you know, I'm sorry. There is a law of war. Even, even if we're at war, that doesn't mean the rules have gone out the window. The key of the Hamdan case is it said, if you're going to cite the rule of war, you actually have to follow it. And that's the exact mistake they made. Now, from Ohio, the great uh, Taft family, Will Taft, uh, the legal advisor of the State Department, was one of the most courageous individuals. Now, he's a loyal member of the administration, but he's a person who is deeply committed to the rule of law. And you have, throughout the historical accounts of this period, a number of loyal members of the administration, but who were, took their prime loyalty as to the Constitution. And they ended up saying, this crosses the line for me. Now, it's easy in these situations, a time of fear, to scapegoat people who look different. Uh, that's what happened to the Japanese Americans. The Pakistani population of New Jersey has declined by almost three quarters during this period. Uh, individuals of the Muslim faith are rounded up. We have so many of them who were actually held and released without ever being charged, and most of them have not brought any kind of action. Many people have lost their chance to get a job. If your name includes the word Hussein, this is frequently brought up. Uh, and I think the real question is, at what point do we come back to the principle that we're judging people by the content of their character? and not the color of their skin or the basis of their religion. Now, we're in, in a multi-ethnic society now. You know, the law director of the city of Cleveland was an Indian American. The assistant secretary for human rights is, was an Asian American. Uh, one of the candidates running for president of the United States in the year 2008 is a Kenyan American who lived in Indonesia. I mean, this is an amazing fact. And the question is, can't we translate this kind of progress and a recognition of the power and strength of our diversity into some greater respect for the differences that this diversity entails? Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we've been listening to Harold Hongju Ko Dean of the Yale Law School and former Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights. Thank you very much, Dean Coe. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned.